right, but we'll go ahead and get started. And Mal, if you could bring up our slides, we will get underway. And we're going to start by introducing ourselves. Um, my name is Alex Dodds. Um, uh, my pronouns are she and her, and I'm going to be the moderator for this um, conversation. You are here if you're just joining us um, in the room for Stay Safe, Get Creative, Pandemic Organizing Strategies that we should use all the time. Um, we'll be talking today about organizing during a global pandemic, um, what we learned from that as um, members of the campaign to elect Janice Lewis-George here in Washington, D.C. in Ward 4 for D.C. Council. Um, and I'm joined by four panelists um, who are all going to, I'd like to invite um, on stage to introduce yourselves. This is going to be an interactive conversation, um, so it's not going to be me um, asking questions, it's going to be a sort of ongoing conversation between all of our, our panelists. So Mal, if you could bring all of our um, speakers on stage, and I think um, we'll just start with you, Michelle, and then Makia, Eileen, and then council member, um, if you could all just introduce yourselves with your role um, on the campaign and uh, what you work on now. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Michelle Whitaker. I was the campaign manager for Janice Lewis George's campaign in Washington, D.C., Ward 4. Um, I am also a political and campaign consultant. I work uh, across the DMV to help mobilize uh, folks to have their voices heard, whether it's in elections or advocacy um, in the legislature. So really glad to be here and to share some of our insights from our, the campaign. Hey everyone, my name is Makia. I am the organizing director for Working Families Party DC. And I had the joy of being on uh, Council Member Janice Lewis George campaign. Um, I work on building a political party of our dreams, um, a political home for the left um, and governing power for the working class. Hey everybody, my name is Eileen Paulette. I run a digital advertising agency called Ravenna Strategies. And I joined all of this amazing team um, right when the pandemic hit to uh, make sure we had a digital ad presence through the campaign. And hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Janice Lewis George. I was the candidate and now am the Ward 4 Council member, th thanks to this uh, amazing team here. Excellent. Well, that's where we're headed. And Janice, we will um, come back to you in just a moment. Um, so the, the team who's all assembled here today worked together, the five of us worked together to elect the now council member um, who is now representing Ward 4 on the DC Council. Um, and we are all be still beyond thrilled um, with the way that this um, campaign went. Um, and it was a very unusual one and we learned a lot. And I'm going to take us back to March 2020. Um, and that's where we're going to start this conversation. This was our, our real campaign plan. We, in March, we had all kinds of great intentions. We, you know, we were 90 days out from the election. We had these goals that we were going to raise $5,000 from DC donors. We had all these benchmarks that we had in mind. Michelle, who's on the uh, conversation today on the call today, was our campaign manager and making sure that we all you know, kept on track with all of this. And then around March 11, all of it went completely out the window and um, COVID happened. And what, you know, we had this really ambitious field plan in mind and all of a sudden all of our plans turned upside down. And um, council member, I think we'll um, start with you if you wanna talk a little bit about what the campaign had been like up until that point and the momentum that we were working to build. And then I want to just spend about two minutes um, together talking about what we have started to refer to among ourselves as the COVID pivot um, and what that time was like, knowing that we were all of a sudden in a state of emergency, but also having this um, very clear election deadline ahead of us. So council member, I'll, I'll start, I'll turn it to you, but welcome anyone on the call to join this part of the conversation. Oh, Janice, you're muted. You're muted. 
of course. Um, still learning during a, camp, a pandemic. But no, um, we started our campaign really early, um, August 1st of 2019. Um, and we did that so that we could knock all the doors that we needed to knock, which was a large, which was a large field of doors that we had to knock. Um, and as a candidate, actually, my favorite thing to do was actually to knock doors. Um, that's where I got my energy. That's where, you know, I felt uh, the strongest. And so we were really committed um, to knocking as many doors as we possibly could. Um, and, and really, I love interacting with people face to face, getting, you know, wanting them to be able to feel who I am um, and be able to talk to them. And so in March, uh, when things shut down, it was just devastating uh, because the thing that gave me the most energy, the the plan we had to knock all of these doors, uh, we really had to, to pivot. Um, and I think we took about 24 hours uh, just to, to, to realize the impact of it. Um, and I think we just had, we were at a pivotal moment where we had to make a decision, you know, what, what are we gonna do in this moment? And for me personally, um, it took me going back to my why, um, why I was running. Um, and one thing about the pandemic is that it really, um, you know, it was a moment for me to realize, you know, some of the same reasons I decided to run uh, were shown to be even more necessary during the pandemic. Uh, so I went on, you know, wanting to support paid family leave. And as we know, the pandemic had so many people having to take leave, needing leave to care for their loved ones, to care for themselves, um, because I believed in fair wages for all workers, um, including our tip workers. And they were the first to lose their jobs during the pandemic uh, when they shut down restaurants. Um, and so every really all of the, the reasons that, you know, wanting to be a people first candidate and put people first. Uh, the moment in, in the campaign when this happened, I could have, you know, I, I made the decision like, you know, I, I, you could go sit down and cry, but then we got to get through this pandemic and we need people first uh, leaders to be a part of, of how we get through this and get out of this. Um, and so it really was me channeling my why and saying, this isn't the moment to give up. This is the moment to double down. Um, and then that's when I turned to the wonderful people around me and said, I'm ready to double down. What can we do? And I'll let them tell you sort of, uh, of how that translated and to keep going. Yeah, well, uh, I'll just jump in and say that um, what uh, Alex is showing you on the screen there, the the activity calendar is a good reminder. And one of um, my core tips that I share with folks, candidates and um, staff who are working on campaigns is you always need to have a campaign plan. And so everybody should be writing a campaign plan and you should have it written down. And it's not just about the activities you're doing here. It's as Janice mentioned, uh, your why for why you're, why you're doing things, how you're organizing yourself. Because when we came to that moment where we realized it was no longer, um, uh, there was no longer an option for us to knock on doors like we wanted to, like we were all getting the energy. We had 60 people come out to a canvas in December yeah. um, and we were like on fire to continue to do that in January and February and through the rest of the campaign. And we realized we had to shift what we were doing. And we looked at what, what we were assembling, why we were doing it and how we could make the shift and the pivot to people uh, throughout the campaign. And so with all of the organized, um, the organizations that had endorsed us at that time, we sat down and had conversations, individual conversations with them to talk about what shift we needed to make, how we can make sure that it aligns with where they wanted to be and what their volunteers were able to do, um, and to really make the case and proposition them about how, if you, if your group was ready to do, you know, a thousand doors, a, a 10,000 doors, we now need you to make that 10,000 doors, 10,000 phone calls or 10,000 texts uh, or 10,000 postcards, right? So that was the shift that we made. And we, we gave people a reason why to see this vision that we're con continuing forward and how even though we were shifting the, the way we were reaching voters, the message was still the same and the energy around it could still be the same. And that's where we introduced different technology as well to make sure that we could do all of that. That's a perfect segue into the next point. Well done, Michelle. Um, which is that, you know, in the last year and a half, so we we pivoted to different technology and different platforms, different ways of reaching people. Probably all of you have ex have been part of those events in the 18 months that we've been um, in the in this pandemic. Um, 
and so we're we're going to touch on them really briefly here but we're going to talk we're going to then kind of shift into what made it possible for us to adapt as a team so before we get to that um, these are some of the things that we did. And um, I, again, invite everybody to sort of weigh in. We had virtual rallies. We had, you know, and virtual events. We had a car parade, which was a total blast. We um, prioritized texting and phone banking. We did postcards. Um, and, you know, we used sort of all of the, we were using any, all, every and every technique that we could that uh, did not require people to knock doors or be together in big rallies to um, reach voters and to use all of these strategies. And I don't know if uh, my fellow panelists have more that they want to say about tactics. We'll talk about these a little bit more as we go as well. Um, but you know, the world is full of incredible platforms and tools. You know, that's one of the things that Netroots is always so amazing at is like just showing us all new ways that we can connect with voters um, and build movements. But we had a couple of core values that helped our team go through this incredible shift in context twice before election day. And we're gonna talk about three things. I'm gonna turn over to Michelle to lead us um, in talking about the first one. So um, be of service. Um, we obviously we're running a campaign and there's an ultimate goal of winning the election. But uh, I also think that we should make sure that we are looking at campaigns as an extension of what we want to see in the world. If we are not um, trying to embody that in the campaigns, then the output that we, we get from that um, can put us in the same cycle that we are trying to change in the world. And so um, it starts with a couple things. And the first thing is how we are in service to each other. Um, and this is where self-care becomes a top priority. And whether you're going through a pandemic or not, you should be prioritizing the self-care for your volunteers and for your staff. This was a critically important thing to me because um, I have many friends who've worked on campaigns and who would tell me how burnt out that they were, how the last day of the, the election, they're in a tub drinking um, whiskey or something like that, trying to like deal with everything that they did in the campaign. And when I was thinking about getting into running uh, campaigns, I was like, I don't want to do that. So what do we have to do to, to make sure that people feel throughout the campaign that they are loved, that they have people who support them? And it starts with self-care. So I do one-on-ones with all of my, my team. Um, I do one-on-ones and check-ins with volunteers to see where they are. And I make sure that if someone is going through something that we are showing our empathy and care for them and finding ways to love them when they're going through that. We had members of our team who, you know, went through health crises and went, when they were going through that, we were sending cards or we we're checking in on them just to see if there's something we could bring some addition to, to help them through uh, their illness or whatever it was. So we we're trying to wait, find ways to be supportive. We were also looking at ways that we um, recognized volunteers beyond just the service to their campaign, but how they're amazing at what they're doing and supporting them and training them up or just giving them the space that they need to be um, superstars that they are. And so again, it's important to see how you do that. And ultimately it's about building that culture of care in your campaign. So if what you're doing is about showing up together as your whole self, as who you are, then you recognize that, embrace that, and let everybody have the opportunity to be who they are in the campaign. Um, go uh, to the next slide, please. So care about you. So um, be of service to, to voters. So of course, we're in a campaign. So we want to make sure voters know about the campaign. They want We want them to show up for Janice and vote for Janice. Um, but we also recognize that because of COVID, there was there were serious gaps of information that voters needed in order to be able to come out and vote. Um, and whether that was changes that were happening with whether or not they were polling locations, um, changes around uh, vote by mail, which for many, um, the introduction of using vote by mail widespread in, in a jurisdiction was very new. For the DC Board of Elections, it was a very new process to expand that to the entire um, electorate. And so they needed to send out ballots. They needed to inform people of what was going on. And I, I believe it was on 
a weekly basis, if it didn't turn into daily basis at some times, we were getting new information that we needed to make sure that we were sharing, that we were adapting our processes to make sure that we could connect with voters. And so that's where we, when we knew new information from the Board of Elections about a process, we incorporated it into our voter outreach and engagement. And one of the biggest things that we needed to do was make sure that if people were getting ballots, they knew how to get their ballots and they could request it in time. And so this became a whole part of our, our shift of doing um, ballot application process and helping people get through that process, whether they were able to email uh, the Board of Elections to get a ballot requested, uh, or they could do the app, which we found out there were some technical issues with using the app. So we were trying to make sure that regardless of the way that a, a voter wanted to get their ballot, we were helping to facilitate that process and get them that information. And it was a real extension of what we wanted to see in office. How do you make sure that every voice is heard? You make sure that everyone can get their ballot and can participate. And it was really great to have conversations with folks on the phone where we would share like, you know, we're just, we're coming to you. We just wanna let you know, like here's the changes that have happened to the election and you'll need to request a ballot. Here's the process to request a ballot. We can also help facilitate that if you'd like. And I can't tell you how many calls uh, when I talked to people that they were so appreciative that the campaign was doing this. And it supported the work that the Board of Elections was doing because they obviously have a much larger universe of people that they are trying to, to um, get the word out to. But you as a campaign, because you are doing that door, you should be doing that door to door or face to face interaction, you have an option opportunity to do it. Um, the last piece, last slide, thank you. Um, be of service to your community. And um, this is really focused on how we need to extend, again, services that are available, um, whether it's talking about mutual aid and how do we support neighbors that need certain um, assistance and how do we connect neighbors to uh, services within the government. And so we were doing work um, again through our texting and phone program to make sure people if they needed unemployment assistance or they needed help um, with groceries or some other need that even though the campaign couldn't uh, take on that capacity we knew we could connect people to the mutual aid work or connect them to the correct uh, council office or dc agency that would help facilitate the process of getting unemployment benefits or other resources that they need and again by us doing that we were showing what what is council member George going to do when she gets in office? And as that is be of service to people, be there when they need it, be able to help answer their questions. And so be of service is a key part, whether you're talking about your, uh, your group, your team, and supporting them with self-care, whether you're talking about voters and making sure that they have the accurate information to have their voice heard, or whether you're, you're engaging with your community and making sure that they have the resources that they need to thrive. Thanks, Michelle. This was a really important part of the campaign. And Council Member Lewis George, I know that you, I often heard this from you um, about being of service. And I wonder if you want to share any thoughts that you have about why this was an important thing to incorporate into the into the process. Let me love. I keep doing that thing. Um, when we first started, um, you know, when, when the pandemic first started, obviously so many um, people were, were shocked by it. And, you know, I didn't want to, you know, make phone calls and just say, hey, my name's Janice, vote for me. Who are you voting for in June? That felt really um, tone deaf and sort of not in, 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 and definitely not in tune with our values. And so um, just talking about the some of the digital strategies that we did, uh, we got to the phones um, and I learned, I, I used to be a person who didn't love the phones, but I learned to love phones, love, love getting on the phones and making these calls. Um, but the call wasn't, you know, we, we put together a script uh, for, for members to use um, who were, who were phone banking with us. And the script wasn't, hi, um, it was, hi, how are you doing? Um, I know we're in a pandemic. How are you doing? Um, this is, I'm calling from Denise Lewis George campaign or hi, I'm, I'm, I'm candidate for, um, for office for war four, uh, how are you doing during this, during this pandemic? And usually people would say, you know, this, it's been rough, you know, my kids are at home, um, and I'm trying to do work at the same time, or I lost my job, um, or I'm a senior and I need, we need, we're, we're running out of toilet paper, we're running out of water, um, and we need more of that. Um, and so 
it became a better conversation to ask the community members, how are you doing and assess what they need. It, it helped better inform me, um, you know, as, as a candidate, but it also uh, added a real value of, of humanity. And it was something where people who loved coming out and knocking doors for our campaign um, had the same level of, of, of care. And so I would say, hey, there's a senior who needs some toilet paper. Can anybody drop some off? And they were like, yeah, we're on it. We got you. So it was a way to use uh, our energy and our organizing in a way that really was a service to the community. And we didn't even get to the question uh, until, you know, when we got further towards the campaign of, hey, who you who are you voting for? And can I get your vote? That was like, that was, that were the conversations that we, we decided to have in like May or June. But in March and April, um, and even leading into May, it was, how are you? How can I be of service to you? How can my team be of service to you? Are there any connections we can make? And we had so many experts, you know, uh, as even just as volunteers. So there were people who needed help navigating unemployment for the first time. And we had people on staff who knew how to do that. And so we got to partner them with some of our volunteers. And so, um, you know, it was such a, um, a human part of who we are as people, as who we are as a campaign and our values uh, to use our tools, not to just promote, uh, you know, me as a candidate, but to to be a value and of service to our community. And I can't tell you how many people said that went a long way for you just calling and asking, how are you doing? Um, it, meant, uh, it, it meant the world. And the other strategy we used was actually the postcards that you saw. And I will say this to you as well. There were a number of people who were just so happy to get postcards during the pandemic. They just weren't getting mail, um, no, you know, and, and it was one thing. And so when they got my postcard in the mail and it was a note from myself or one of our volunteers, they loved the postcard. So every, every single strategy we used had a human touch to it. Um, and, and it was, that was what we really tried to do throughout the, throughout the rest of, uh, the campaign. Yeah. And I'll underscore, you know, this, the second slide that Michelle presented was about the changes to voting that happened mm -hmm. with just weeks to go before, um, before the election. And it was very clear to us as a campaign that like, we actually just needed to tell people how to fit, how to go through the process of voting, not, not who they should vote for, but just how to vote. Um, the process of voting um, by mail or, um, you know, uh, with the drop boxes was all new for most people. Mm -hmm. um, and getting the information out about that felt very clear and made a lot of sense to me, but I'm gonna turn it over to Eileen um, to, to answer this question and then take us into the next section, which is that, you know, that's not necessarily the way that most campaigns approach uh, getting out the vote. Yeah, I think, you know, working on a lot of campaigns that were trying to make the same pivot, this being of service was a very unique model in general, but especially the how to vote piece was really unique. I don't think we have a picture of it, but the Janice website had a page that was more clear, better explained how to vote than anything the Board of Elections put out the entire time. It, it had a phone number, a hotline that was staffed by campaign members to explain how to vote. This was not about voting for Janice. This was just about the process of doing it. And the same way that I think a lot of people responded to getting help, getting postcards just by the human interaction, I think that emphasis on just the process and not who was really um, spoke well to a lot of voters. Um, they felt less pressured, but still really communicated with. Um, and I'm going to talk about paid comms here in a second, but I think that sort of more subtle way of communicating our values was really effective. Um, and yeah, there was a there was a page on the website. A bunch of our ads were just not why you should vote for Janice, but how to vote, um, where you needed to show up, what days you needed to get things in. Um, and I think that was really an incredible strategy. Um, I think we should go to the next slide and I'll start talking about um, acting collectively, which is another thing I think the campaign did that I saw really unique from other campaigns as a paid comms person. I usually talk to the other consultants on a team, maybe one um, campaign manager, maybe the candidate, but I 
am never on a team where I get to talk to the field staff and the comm staff and the graphic designer and everybody. And I think that was a really cool, unique way that this campaign was organized. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, so like I said, all of us consultants, there were there was a male consultant as well, um, were we're working with all the departments of a campaign. Usually there are just very serious silos and those were all broken down. And I think especially in our digital advertising, we were advertising content around or like organizing events, um, voter contact events, uh, how to vote and our actual message. You know, we had more traditional ads that were explaining Janice's story. Um, and something we realized is that our voters in an urban setting like this are also our donors, are also our volunteers. And it didn't make sense to treat different groups of people, um, you know, with a totally unique, you're just a voter who we're gonna talk, talk to about persuasion. You're just a donor who we're gonna try and raise money off of and get to show up to volunteer. That just didn't make sense here. And it meant that all the barriers in the internal teams came down. So. Um, like I said, I talked to field staff all the time about what their goals were and how we could support that with our paid program and making sure that the message was incredibly unified across the paid, the organizing, um, the outreach, just every piece. And you can see in this slide, there was a real visual language that was maintained across every form of communication. The design for this campaign was incredibly strong. And I think there was also just really strong adherence to our message since we knew um, anyone we were reaching out to about volunteering was also somebody who was potentially an undecided voter. Um, and any undecided voter could potentially become a donor and a volunteer because, you know, there, there weren't really Republicans we were talking to. <laughs> um, so let's go to the next slide. Um, the, you know, we layered a lot of different kinds of communication. Um, and these are a couple of examples. I think the last slide also showed some of our mail. Um, you know, there were postcards, there were events, there was promotion for all of those things. There were yard signs. Um, there was just a ton of different ways we were communicating. And a lot of them were supporting partnerships. Um, so this is just another way that this was not a siloed campaign. Like, you know, the campaign coordinated with many other groups and cross promoted. And I think in a virtual world where we were doing a lot of online events, that was super helpful in getting more people to join online events, especially as people got sort of zoomed out. Um, and and Makia, who's on the call, um, was part of the uh, team working to create all of these events. And Makia, I'll turn it to you to talk a little yeah. bit more about this. Yeah, so one of the things that was, um, I had the great opportunity of, you know, Working Families Party really cared about how do we can movement orgs um, in movement to this campaign. That was the beauty of uh, Janice's campaign that, you know, it wasn't just it wasn't just about individualism, it was collectivism. Um, and the ground game, the calls and everything was powered by this relationship. And that's something that we saw in COVID, right? When you go through crisis, what was the endearing um, thing that came out of community was the strength of our movements and the strengths of our networks. Um, and so we wanted to create events that were not just, you know, we didn't just set a plan for the rest of the season. These are the events we're gonna talk about because this is on the platform. It was, what are we hearing on the phones? Who are the folks that are newly endorsing? Wh whose voices are not being heard right now in the middle of this crisis? And what can we do um, to uplift those voices? And so I know that when we were planning these events, we were calling everyone that we knew to get you know, the most directly impacted person to be able to speak um, about their experience. 
and to be able to sit at the table with Janice. And so Janice could learn from those folks. And so we were so able to adapt in the moment because of these events, because of these partnerships and because of the collectivism across the campaign. Yeah, and I know that you're gonna talk about that exact point a little bit more in just a moment, but I think you know now these organizations who we built relationships with as part, because of this unique Zoom universe that we had to organize in, we suddenly had opportunity to have conversation with the DC Tenants Union and Bread for the City who supports um, unhoused and folks who are vulnerable residents. Um, and I, I think council member, if you wanna talk a little bit about why that felt Meaningful, not only campaigning, you know, these are not organizations who officially endorse a candidate. They're nonprofits and they're, you know, they were really providing information. This um, housing is a human right um, event in particular was talking about housing resources that people could access as um, folks lost employment and income. And so council member, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about like how that the, building those relationships during the campaign with these sort of service organizations and movement groups and movement members um, has has carried through into your now council member office um, and what it, what how that has been informed had informed your work. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think um, one of the things even as a candidate um with with having working with the grassroots organization was saying you know this my campaign was a movement um and that you know we were going to all we were, we were all in this together and being able to do town halls uh with so many organizations who i had worked with you know prior to, to being a candidate um was a part of showing that we were going to this wasn't going to be the only time uh, you know, during a campaign, but we were going to work together throughout. And so even now, as I prepare legislation, uh, we just did a legislation um, extending the the moratorium for foreclosures that came from uh, our, our legal aid, our housing um, advocates. And so now, even now, when we have we have programs like State DC to, to help families be able to uh, get the money they need for rent and for for their mortgages. Um, that information is coming to me from organizations like Bread for the City and Latino Economic Development Center, and they're telling me what's missing. Uh, they're saying, hey, these, hey, you know, these these forms, they're they're too difficult. They, they you know, they're creating barriers uh, for so many residents. Our, our uh, sec, uh, English and second language uh, um, uh, constituents. And so I get to go back and say, hey, we need to change this form. You know, so it, it's I get to use these organizations who are on the grassroots level to help me inform my legislation and also my oversight. If I'm hearing on the ground, if, 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 if they're saying to me, oh, we have all this money and we're trying to get it out and I'm hearing on the ground that they're not getting that money out fast enough or they're not supporting residents, um, I'm able to, to utilize the same organizations that helped me throughout the this campaign who did housing panels with me to inform the work that I do uh, on housing. And the same goes for education. Every union that supported me. I wasn't just saying I want your union endorsement. I was saying, hey, I want to I want to be an advocate for your workers. So even now, as we, we grapple with education, I go to the Washington Teachers Union as we grapple with transit issues. I, I go to the American Transit Union. And so um, and our healthcare workers are still in need. Right. So 1199 SEIU, there's still, at, at, you know, there's still issues on the ground. And I'm able to take those issues um, because I have this relationship with all of these organizations. And so that's what, you know, really, I think what, what solidarity and movement campaigns are. It's having someone on every level. I think uh, Bernice King says, you know, uh, the, the work is wherever we are. And so for me, the work is in legislation, um, but the work is also on the ground uh, and in the grassroots level. And so I have those connections uh, with our grassroots organization. And I use those to bring our issues to the forefront and create solutions for the problems um, that we face. And I just wanted to chime in um, about our um, online events. So uh, it's always a good reminder that um, when you go virtual, uh, there is a digital divide that still exists. Mm -hmm. And we need to be mindful of who cannot be at the table, potentially, if we're doing all virtual. And so some of the ways that we tried to combat that and make sure that we were uh, creating inclusive environments was with uh, some of the panels to also offer uh, a phone access uh, ability to just call in and listen and participate in the conversation um, to help support that the work that we're doing. And then um, it's really important if you have the opportunity to do uh, 
um, language access uh, ability, um, within the uh, town halls, the virtual town halls, to have translation available so that everyone can participate yeah. fully um, in their language and, and ask questions and um, comment as, as they may need. And one of the things that we did with this team, and I want to give kudos to um, Alex for really helping to organize this, was setting up that with every virtual event, we had a clear template of who was being the facilitator, what, you know, what mm -hmm. were the links, here's the slide deck that we're using, here's kind of the run of show of what we were doing in there, here's where we pop in these questions, who's, who's being the um, Zoomologist, our technology person to help answer any tech issues that were going on during that so that the facilitators of the um, meeting could just focus on on asking questions or or facilitating the conversation. And that one gave uh, different volunteers opportunities to participate. Mm -hmm. It also gave us, um, it wasn't on just one person's shoulder to like run a Zoom call. And if for anybody who's done Zoom calls, you know, it can be overwhelming if you're doing both, both fielding all the questions, trying to facilitate the conversation, trying to man the slides and everything else in between that. So I strongly encourage you, just like we write plans for every part of the campaign, the field plan and the our, what we're doing with communications and other operations, write out how you operate in an online um, setting so that you're clear about what you need and make sure that if you're in, when you're inviting people that you offer a way for people to indicate if they need an assistance like um, translation or some other assistance to participate yeah. fully in the conversation. Incorporating those now can translate into what you also need to hold accountable for the um, government agencies to do that. And what we've seen is that some government agencies have been have lagged behind in doing that, but when they see campaigns doing this work better than they do it, they start to implement them. And so campaigns can be a model of, again, what we wanna see happen in our society. Yeah. I just want to add two things to that what Michelle was saying. One, language access was a huge thing. And actually, uh, we had our campaign signs, our website in, in, in Spanish and Amharic, which were two populations that are, are a large populations who are in my ward. And for so many people, they were they really appreciated the language access um, that we were able to bring uh, not only to our virtual events, but that we brought to our mailers, that we brought to uh, when we had handouts. Um, it, to, to many people, they said, you know, people don't think I'm a voter, but I am. And we brought in new voters who previously had not been engaged because we we ended the language access barrier that had persisted for so long. And we were actually the first campaign to have, you know, have our signs and have literature in different languages. Um, the other piece I was going to say, as a candidate, it's also very helpful when town halls have multiple people on it because it takes it gives you a little bit of a break. You get to interact with others. It gives other people the opportunity to talk. Um, and, you know, you know, as a candidate, I would say that having multiple people on a panel really, you know, helps helped me, you know, take all of the pressure and weight off of me and allowed me to be able to listen and learn at the same time and really model that the type of leader I was going to be was also a listener um, and to not think that I knew everything, but I was going to go to the grassroots level to, to learn those things. So uh, that was also helpful for me as a candidate. It took a lot of pressure off and actually made me feel really comfortable. And I got to learn uh, as I was leading. So, yeah. Plus we got to get to know all kinds of wonderful leaders across the city, which was so yeah. great. Um, so we had these two overriding principles, being of service and acting collectively. Um, and that helped us stay really flexible together and not just flexible, but united as a team as we went through this really tumultuous time of adjusting to COVID. Um, and I'm gonna turn it to Makia now to talk about our third, the third section of our conversation um, and how that um, played out. Thank you. So number three is about responding to the moment. We went through um, one pandemic and then a week before election day, we went through another one. Um, in On May 25th, 2020, Oops, um, no problem. On May 25th, 2020, um, George Floyd um, was murdered by uh, police in Minneapolis. And that sparked um, an uprising across the country and across the world that 
truly sparked the largest protest movement in this country's history. And if you can imagine, we had already been in a place of shifting it and, and um, being a campaign that believed in freedom and liberation for all um, and freedom from oppression and wanted to get at the root causes of violence in our community. Um, we were just in the right place um, where everyone was asking, you know, what is our response? What are we going to do? And our opposition um, was trying to come at us, um, to put us in a, in a hard place, to push Janice to change um, to, to change her values, right? Mm -hmm. um, and one of the amazing things that we saw was that not only Janice, but every member of this team um, was ready to respond to the moment and hold to our values. You can see right here, this is a picture of a mailer that went out um, to community. They sent about three mailers um, and to misrepresent um, Janice's, uh, Council Member Lewis George's values and what her platform was. Um, so there was misrepresentation um, and they were targeting community um, to, to really play on people's feelings of lack of safety. Mm -hmm. um, but what we were able to do was respond to the moment of the uprising and say that we're actually alongside the working class people who are risking their lives to go outside and raise their voices. Um, and even though our opposition thought that they could shake us, it actually worked for our benefit. And Janice, um, feel free if you want to talk about that experience um, when these mailers are going out. Yeah, um, you know, I, I would say right before George Floyd actually was Ahmaud Arbery, uh, which occurred in um, Georgia, and it was sort of an escalating conversation about uh, what actually keeps com our community safe uh, and what safety looks like. Um, and I think when these mailers were coming out, it was just particularly uh, piercing, I think, you know, for me as a black woman um, to really see that, you know, the idea of investing in our communities was so offensive that they would use fear mongering mechanisms to try to uh, destroy or silence that. And it, it was really showing how much they they were actually a part of the problem of wanting to do the same thing um, over and over again and expect a different result. Uh, when we knew that investing in our communities was def was 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 actually what was necessary and what will actually keep us safe, we knew that the most the communities that are the safest were the communities that, that were the most resourced, um, and we know that they are that those are the communities that are the safest that are the communities that are the most resourced. Um, as a candidate, you know, getting these type of mailers can, you know, feel, you know, it, it can feel very, you know, you can feel very violated in, in a very real way um, for people to uh, misrepresent you, but also as, as a per, as a black person experiencing what was happening and watching that video um, and, and the entirety of that video, you know, for me, it, it really was a, another moment, just like with the pandemic, whether should I shy away or should I double down on my values? And for me, it was like, we're gonna double down on our values, right? Because this moment has taught us that that's, what, that's what's needed. And, and that's why I'm running in the first place because uh, you gotta be unafraid um, to, to really speak truth to power. Um, and so uh, the other thing about that was that I had a team around me who shared those values and really encouraged me uh, in that moment um, and uh, made me comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, and that's something that you, you have to do. Um, and so even as we were, you know, we're still in the midst of this campaign, we're experiencing all of these movements around us. Uh, I said, you know, even while we're at the at the polls, we're going to honor and value and, and continue to, you know, show uh, why we're here. And so, uh, you know, the picture you see here is, you know, we said, let's get on, let's get, uh, let's get everyone uh, at the polls on their knees and let them, let, let them feel what it's like to, to be there for, what was it? How many, nine, was it nine minutes? There's always back and forth of the minutes, um, but whatever it's it, over more than enough minutes, uh, egregious amount uh, of, of George Floyd's life uh, as, as it ended. 
Um, and so it was a time to just use that moment to educate people, to have them experience and, and feel what we were doing. And, and to be honest with you, when we got to the polls, some people said, you know what, I'm here because they sent that mailer because they, <laughs> um, and so speaking about, you know, things that came back, uh, for our benefit, it was actually, you know what, the voice that you you have in this moment is the voice that we need. Um, and so that's that's really how that that um, played out. And, it, and you know what, it's still playing out. It's still a requirement for me to use my voice uh, in that way and to call it out um, and to, to fight back against the fear mongering uh, that's created to maintain the status quo. Definitely. And one thing that was also that's also just advice for for others is that what was we really held to our our individual our individual humanity mm-hmm. that we were not just machines this was not just a talking point that yeah. we were experiencing loss through this pandemic and pain and trauma through this uprising mm-hmm. um, that we had lost people to violence throughout the entire season. Um, And we had to show up for each other and show up to work. And that allowed for our volunteers to know that they could also be human and that they could also show up um, and be our full selves. And that's at the end of the day, we were creating, we were modeling the type of district that we want to live in, in our campaign. Um, and really modeling what um, what 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 word for uh, the um, district that we were running in um, could look like, you know, if people joined our side. And that was another beautiful piece about it. And I know that for other people working in elections and all across the country, there are going to be other uprisings. There are going to be whirlwinds when an issue area that maybe you were talking about before, no one was talking about, no one really cared about it. And now you put it on the internet and it has, it goes viral in two seconds. All the media wants to do is hear your perspective on this thing. And it can be really easy to just be like, you know, we're just going to wait till it blows over. Um, but you have to recognize that these whirlwind moments are opportunities, that your base is being politicized and they are now questioning the world around them in the status quo. And it is your job to provide a political home and a space for them to get active um, beyond your election day as well. And so for us, that was a big value of why it meant, what it meant to really respond to a moment. Yeah, I'm getting shivers thinking back to that time and how intense it it was. Um, And the fact that we were able to stay focused on what uh, brought us together as a team was really like uh, keeping a point of focus during a storm. Um, And it was really transformative. And we weren't the only ones and um, who who agreed with all of this. And I wanted to take um, space as we come to the end of our time together to name that it was a really big movement that we brought together um, this is a, a full list of everyone who donated to or took action as part of the campaign. There was hundreds of people who made it possible and who um, were moved by the culture and um, energy and community that came together behind candidate Ginny Lewis George, um, even through these really tumultuous times. Um, and as we close out, we open the floor for questions or if um, any of the other, my fellow panelists have final points that you want to um, take away from these pandemic organizing strategies that we should use all the time. And if you have those questions, you can type them in the chat. Um, We'll do our best to answer them as they come in. Um, Thanks to everyone who's been. Mm-hmm. Go for well, it. folks are uh, writing their question. I just want to um, reiterate um, that it is important for you to be your authentic self in a campaign, regardless of whatever role you're playing, candidate, staff member, volunteer. Um, and when we show up that way as ourselves, that's when we are able to shine together individually and together as a group. And I think that's what we see, that we were able to be unapologetic about our positions on issues because we knew that we had folks who were supporting us and giving us the ability to, to act swiftly, to speak with authority and truth on issues. And so um, it's really important that, uh, that you have that grounding and that support. And that goes back to the team that you build and the culture that you build. And so Janice had a um, group around her of both um, 
leaders who were offering advice, strategic advice, volunteers, family members, friends, who were all helping to support um, that to make sure that we could run a campaign that left all of us out of it, feeling more energized and excited about the possibilities that we have, so. Yeah. And I was gonna say, um, you know, other things as, as a candidate, um, you know, for me, I get energy from being with, being in relationship with others. And so, um, you know, I wasn't somebody who was like, you know, five steps away from my volunteers. I tried to, I, I did my best to experience with volunteers. When I, when we were knocking doors, I knocked doors with different volunteers. It wasn't a special volunteer. It'd be like, oh, you're coming today uh, to volunteer for me. How about you hop on with me? And people were like, what? I'm going to knock with you. I'm like, yeah, you're knocking doors with me. Um, and then when I pivoted to the phones, you know, it was a transition, but I wanted to be excited. You know, I, I decided to get excited about it, to do phones. And I would always do like videos showing people that we, I was in constant motion. I think somebody said to me, all I kept seeing every day was you online doing something. Like I was on the phones and I would show like, Hey, you know, I had my Instagram ready. Like I'm on the phone, 200 phone, phone calls today. It's getting done. Let's go. And always there to like, you know, keep my, 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 the volunteers energy up. Um, that, that was a, a fun task for people who didn't like being on the phones. We had people who loved writing postcards. I wasn't, a, I'm not a writer of postcards, but, um, a lot, actually a lot of our volunteers, um, particularly uh, even our older volunteers preferred the, the, the postcard writing. And so it really was a campaign for all generations, um, which made it really, really great. Um, we had young people come out in, in, I think historic numbers really. Um, and when I, we got to the polls, the, the at the end of the line, we were in, we were, unfortunately we had a, a situation where people were at the polls till 1 AM, 3 AM in the morning. And you know the last couple of voters at every that night uh, at 1 a.m. in the morning, 3 a.m. in the morning were young people, and they said, "Look, I'm in line because Black Lives Matter. I'm in line because I, you know, working. I'm I'm a working families party person. Like I'm in line because you believe in unions and you believe in union workers. I mean, it was amazing to be." Um, to be there in that moment to hear why people showed up, and I, and I got to tell you, uh, people showed up not be, just because of you know because of me. They showed up because they believed in in us as a collective and us being a movement. Um, so don't you know I say don't make it about don't make it about you. Make it about you know I guess in the words of Bernie, not me, us. Um, and that's what it really felt like uh, that it wasn't just about me. It was about all of us collectively. Yeah. It so was. And I see your question, Sarah, about um, as we sort of come out of this total strict quarantine and uh, as folks get vaccinated um, and we start to come back together safely in person, what are some, and I think I'll put this to Michelle, since I know that you're working on a campaign right now um, that's probably doing hybrid events. How can we work around Zoom fatigue and get folks to engage both in person and online? What are some of the sort of hybrid approaches now as folks are coming back together? Yeah, so Sarah, this is a great question. And I think one important thing that I would do is for uh, Zoom, any online meeting uh, that you're doing, you need to keep those tight. Uh, and so I would not have them go longer than an hour um, just because of that fatigue moment. I also think it's great uh, if you can incorporate um, different interactive um, tools that not necessarily require them to have different technology, but that get the conversation going. You, Alex modeled this at the start where, you know, she said welcome and invited folks to put in the chat where they're coming from. Um, that's a great way to engage and make sure that people are asking questions. Another thing that you can do is add music. If we, you know, if you can incorporate music into your session, people get excited. They feel, they feel that vibe of being in a, an environment that isn't just a normal Zoom call that we do for every day, maybe in our in our work. So add music, add quiz quizzes or something that gives people an opportunity to like respond back to things. Um, in our current campaign, we we started really early and we're reminding people the election isn't until next year. And so there's different moments where I prop people and I say, "What day is election day?" And people respond back to it. And I'm like, "What do you need to do? Who? Can, how can you register people to vote?" And people are responding about those questions. And so make it something where they get the vibe, even if they're online, that it's an exciting place. And if you do that, it's mimicking what you'll do in an in-person environment. And then for in-person, real quick, just again, practice um, social distancing. 
um, I we have required right now that any in-person event, we're only having folks who are vaccinated participate in in-person just because we wanna protect the safety of folks who are attending and our staff. And so um, set up those rules so that you're protecting everybody and just being familiar that, you know, people are still, getting started to come out. And so we want to make sure safety is and health is protected. Yeah. I know we just have a minute left, a couple of minutes left. So I wanted, I just want to quickly jump in with sort of a pre the previous topic we were discussing um, and say, I think one of the really unique things about this campaign, something that's really different from how other people think about things a traditional campaign is very focused on metrics and being like the message needs to be persuasion. The message needs to be GOTV. Um, and it doesn't really allow people to show up as their whole selves. It doesn't really allow for some of that community building that this campaign did exceptionally well. And I think what what these guys proved is that you can win that way. Um, and I think a lot of organizers in traditional campaign world think they need to move themselves um, and just be very uh, like tight almost in being about the campaign and about the message and not about like the humanity of things. Um, and I think this campaign really proved that there is a way to win and show up as whole people, care about community, not just talk about um, the policies, but talk about real people um, and what they're going through right now, even if that isn't, um, you should vote for me because language. Um, so I was really impressed. Thanks, Eileen. And I'm going to give it to Makia for our last words. Yes, I'll second everything. I think one other thing that um, can seem like a small thing, but you know, one of our values at WFP is radical um, hospitality. And so I, when we started this session, I was like, oh man, I wish we had some music. Um, and so that was another thing that people like got used to when mm -hmm. they came into a space, um, us jamming out together, having dance sessions, um, make this stuff fun, right? We get so, we can get very robotic and forget, you know, what are the things that bring us together? What are the things you need at a cookout or a family reunion? And how can I bring that into my spaces, whether in person or virtual, really makes that fun. Um, and so, you know, virtual events are now going to be a part of campaigns for the rest of the time, right? Even outside of a pandemic, it is about accessibility and it is a skill and intentionality really is the key to accessibility. So take the time, bring in people who are skilled at holding space and being hospitable. Um, so that way everyone has a good time. It was a good time. And Makia didn't do this, but I'll do it for them. Um, if you are not already a member of the Working Families Party in your uh, state or city, look them up. Working Families Party, DC Working Families Party was an incredible partner on this campaign. And they're the ones who hold a lot of campaign organizing here in DC um, cycle over cycle because we built an incredible team um, for this campaign and we want to keep working together on the next one. Um, with that, keep in touch. These are our um, where you can find us on the internet. Please follow Council Member Lewis George if you're in DC for everything you need to know now about how the DC Council is going to shake things up and the community behind the, uh, all of them. Thanks to all of you who joined us today. Um, and enjoy the rest of NetRoots. Uh, thanks for being here. <laughs>